Morning ladies and gentlemen, Peter Rossier from Foundation Expo 88 YouTube and this morning, up in the afternoon actually going, I am with David Henscliffe, former councillor, former deputy mayor and most importantly for the purposes of this exercise, chairman of Save the Pagoda. Now in our various YouTubes we have done a little piece uh, on Frank and Myra Pitt which I then re-edited down to a, sm a smaller size because John McGregor did uh, quite a long interview uh, and part of that interview was a very heartfelt thank you by David uh, to Frank and Myra, who are now almost 90. Um, and so uh, what I wanted to do on this YouTube is just find out from David what the, the gen genius was that sparked him into wanting to save the pagoda. Because in those days, um, a Nepalese pagoda uh, in the 80s was probably not um, the way that it's viewed today as an extraordinarily iconic piece of Brisbane. So where did the genius come from, David? Well, I was a, a freshman uh, in council. I'd been in council about two months when Expo started. Uh, so I was all of about 32. Um, and 32? I thought you were 32 then. Yeah, 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 right. Thanks very much for that. Uh, the uh, flattery will get you everywhere. Um, and uh, Expo was, was just a sensation, um, I think. Uh, I'd arrived in council and the councillors were going out every night uh, meeting with ambassadors, yeah. uh, with presidents, uh, with kings and queens and princes and princesses who were arriving and coming and going. And I thought, wow, this is a great job. Um, I should have got into council a lot, a lot uh, earlier. Of course, when Expo finished, all of that stopped and we got back to dogs and drains and ditches and the parking meters and all the rest of the stuff that councillors do. So I started on a high point and the rest of my career dropped <laughs> down. But um, when Expo was winding up, a lot of people were saying, we don't want the party to end. Mm. Uh, they wanted to keep it going. They also wanted things about Expo that would live on. Um, and we knew that we would get the land that Expo was on. Uh, of course, that took a long time to come to fruition, as it often does. The, the interesting point on that one is that there's also a YouTube with uh, Salio Hillshed, and when you say it got, with, Queensland has got the land, well, it didn't, the original intention was Queensland was going to get the money from the land, not that's necessarily right. the land. That's, right. that's another story. Well, and it's a fascinating story because when you look at World Expos uh, and you know, the big shows that have happened in various places around the world, whether it's Paris, which kept its Eiffel Tower, or uh, New York, which lost most of its, uh, its a big show from about 100 years ago. 39, I think. 39 was the well, lost, yeah. And they, they didn't keep much, but there's always a lot of controversy associated with what happens after the party. You've actually just come back from New York, just digressing yeah. a little bit, and uh, some of the research that I've done for this shows that New Yorkers mm -hmm. believe uh, that the best World Fair yeah, is, was held by New York. But you're right, they kept almost nothing, mm -hmm. unlike Knoxville, which mm -hmm. has only just said that they're celebrating their 30th, I think. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. 30th anniversary. And they have just spent a lot of money uh, on renovating and rebirthing their parks, their needle, the whole works. Mm. Um, I, I think in a, a, a city like Brisbane or Knoxville, that probably isn't, you know, it hasn't been a world city. It's not a mecca for international tourism. New Yorkers um, have got so many great icons. You know, they can afford to let some of these places go. But for Brisbane, that was one of our seminal moments. That was a, a, a part of our maturity. It's a bit like the Commonwealth Games was a coming of age, Expo was a coming of age. We're always at that point of coming of age. Uh, and so we should have a lot of those sorts of places. Now, the, the Pagoda, was a very special uh, thing because it had been fabricated in Nepal. It was from Nepalese timber, um, and it was uh, it was a, a quiet, restful place in the middle of all of that mm. energy and excitement and noise that was uh, Expo '88. Uh, so when the, when it looked like it was going off to Japan for I think a park expo. Um, Osaka or Kobe, wherever it was, um, we said, well, you know, can't, can't we hold on to it? I started a negotiation with the people who ran the pagoda, the Nepalese delegation, um, 
And then we, they set a price uh, for it. Uh, the Nepalese government isn't rich, so you couldn't blame them for not just giving it to what is, let's face it, a very rich country. Um, so they're not in the business of charity. So we uh, got, got in touch with the federal government. Initially, uh, Graeme Richardson, he put me on to Gareth Evans. Uh, Gareth Evans had some money in a grant called the Peace Grants, which were designed to promote uh, peace. Uh, so the um, Australian government said, you yeah, know, we think it can probably fit with, you know, in that category. And then that started negotiations with Sally Ann and then with, um, uh, I think it was Brian Austin yes, yeah. from, from the state government. And the interesting thing is that if we go to, um, again, John McGregor is the font of all knowledge on these things, uh, is a thousand years, or well, represents a thousand years of peace. Mm. And was, so I can understand, understand where Gareth's uh, connection. Yeah. Well, they, oh, they, they said it was a bit tenuous. They said, look, we'll be stretching <clears throat> the grant criteria uh, because normally it's about programs uh, that we would foster in various countries to promote better understanding and peace. But this is something in, in our lap in Brisbane, and it's, it's from Nepal, uh, there, there are all sorts of reasons why yeah, we, can, we can stretch a point. Um, and the other three levels of government all chimed in and put some money in, but they all had as a condition that we had to raise money from the private sector. We had to demonstrate tangibly and financially that Brisbane residents wanted it. And one of the sad things, and it's probably not, I don't know how appropriate it is to mention, but one of the sad things is when we launched this campaign, there were some people in Brisbane, crazies, who said, this is a work of the devil. It's not a Christian thing. It's Nepalese. It's, uh, it's got gods incorporated in the, uh, in the sculpture and bar relief of the pagoda, which are evil. Um, so, you know, whenever you do something in public life, there's always someone who will find fault. Um, but we, look, we ignored all of that. Uh, that would have been a tiny fraction of 1% of people who felt uncomfortable about something that was unchristian and uh, pagan uh, being in Brisbane. Thank uh, God that uh, there oh. is one person who uh, was so generous of heart, Frank. Well, Frank and Myra, uh, yes. who were, look, I'm just so pleased that they're around to celebrate the 25th because uh, Brisbane owes them a huge debt of gratitude. Mm, those. They stepped out of the shadows uh, when pretty much uh, we'd given up hope of being able to get uh, sufficient public funds. Um, and they, uh, you know, they really should be honoured for their contribution. Yeah, so I love that in the YouTube he says, and if you come across an iconic thing, you should grab it. <laughs> it was such a classic moment. Mm. So good on you, Frank. Yeah. You're a gentleman and a scholar. Yeah. Anyway, uh, as you can see, before I actually close down this YouTube, I should just point out that David's current career is r represented around us. Uh, it's some really quite amazing and quite beautiful artwork. Uh, and so with that, I'll just close down this YouTube and we'll be back in a second. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>